So it, it, uh, I can only echo uh, Dr. Baccherini's uh, words. Thank you very much for to uh, Marine and uh, Nicolas for inviting us. It is a privilege for me to share, to co-chair with uh, Daniela. Uh, first speaker of this session is Dr. Toshio Mori from the Nagoya National Insurance Hospital, who talked to us about diagnostic and follow-up of acute macular neuroretinopathy. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak here today. Uh, I'm going to introduce a case of acute macular neuroretinopathy in which an uh, AO image was helpful for diagnosis and follow-up. The case is a 32-year-old female, and she visited our hospital for a crescent-shaped white spot on her left eye, which she had for two weeks. Her visual acuity was normal, but in the Amstrad chart, which represents her subjective vision, there was a crescent-shaped scotoma on the temporal area of the center. Humphrey showed a decrease of retinal, retinal sensitivity at almost the same area, but found this camera, Ot Florence, and FAG IAG seemed normal, and even the SDOCT didn't show an obvious abnormal, abnormality. Then we took AO image by Artix1. We found an area in which cones had clearly decreased, and the shape was consistent with that of the Amstrad chart. Only AO images shows ob objective abnormality, which led us to diagnose her as acute macular neural retinopathy. In the clinical course, we followed up with Arctic Swan and SDOCT. OCT showed almost no change for the observation period, but AO images showed the recovery of cone cells clearly. Focusing on the yellow box, we can see the density of cone cells increase gradually. In conclusion, the AO image was very helpful for both diagnosis and follow-up of acute macular neural retinopathy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mori, for your presentation. We'll move to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Kojaste from Stanford University, the Byers Eye Institute, talking to us on puffy cones. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your kind invitation. And thanks, colleagues, for their nice presentation. <laughs> Okay, uh, the case uh, was a young lady with blur vision in her left eye. The visual acuity was 2020 in the right eye and 2025 in the left eye. In past medical story, she had a Lyme disease uh, several years ago, which was treated. Uh, this is the fundus photo of the left eye. Here is the challenge. Is it it's a chronic uitis with some pigmentary changes or a retinal dystrophy. This is always, always a challenge in our clinics. Let's have a look on the OCTs. The OCT of the both eye, you can see that uh, there is no abnormality and seems unremarkable. Now let's have a look on the AO image of the left eye. This is the central four wall AO image. Look, uh, this is the similar cases that presented with other colleagues. Look at the central part, the cones are visible. I pick up the area with the uh, margin with the normal and puffy cones. Here you can see that area. Here you see the normal cone mosaic. And here you can see the enlarged visible cones. Then we did a genetic test. Well, she was tested positive for ABCA4. But the point was that the mutation was heterogeneous. I mean, she was carrier for ABCA4. She was not a full-blown Ishtargat or RP disease. So as a take-home message, uh, puffy cones can be uh, early signs of retinal dystrophy, even in carrier disease, as we shown here. And 
since this patient is still had some degrees of inflammation, we cannot exclude the role of inflammation in this case. Maybe because of inflammation, the cones have been uh, enlarged. We don't know. Thank you for your kind invitation and your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ursula Reinstein from the Retina Clinic London, who will show us adaptive optics and multi multimodal imaging for the follow-up of a patient with CSR uh, and RPE changes. Thank you very much, everyone, for having me here this afternoon. Um, I'm working in Professor Stanga's team. Um, so this case report is about a 63-year-old male with a stress type A personality, and we diagnosed him uh, when he came about two years ago with a central serous retinopathy. Um, in the last two years, he came to our clinic about 22 times, and his uh, CSR kept on recurring, and then it kept resolving. Um, in the two years, he was uh, treated with um, three courses of anti-VEGF, and with Diamox, but most of the times we actually decided to uh, just observe. Uh, the fundus images um, are rather unremarkable. Um, he was only diagnosed with CSR in his right eye, and you will see in the next images that the changes are just beneath the macular area. Um, so this is the oh. first time when he came to us. Um, you can see the subretinal fluid just below the macular area. Um, uh, and this was just the fellow eye, the left eye. There was nothing in the left eye, so it was just in the right eye. Um, eight months later, he came again. Oh, no, he came often in between, but uh, eight months later, um, I'm just showing you a sequence uh, in the top on the 12th of January. He presents with a subretinal fluid. Um, a week later, this is gone, and two weeks later, it's there again. Um, then eight months later, we decided to uh, take RTX images. In this one, you can see that the subretinal fluid had actually resolved. Um, two months later, we took another, uh, we asked him to come again. Um, we took another set of images. What you can actually see on the right, so these images refer to the 11th January visit. Uh, so these images are taken on the same day. However, they differ already because we took them in different depths. So this is just something to, uh, to mention. And this is the last image we took of him in March this year. Here can, you can see that the subretinal fluid had fully resided. Um, however, the changes are still there. So on this last image, on this last slide, I just wanted to show you the difference between the, uh, the three bi-monthly visits. You can see changes between the, the images, but um, the question is, are these changes actually significant um, or are they just changes and will they remain um, for this patient or will they eventually go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ursula, for showing us this interesting case. Our last presenter of the session is uh, Stefano Mercuri uh, from the Careggi Teaching Hospital in Florence on adaptive optics imaging in syphilitic retinopathy. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. Today, I'm going to talk about adaptive optics imaging of photoreceptors in acute syphilitic posterior placoid retinopathy. ASPPC is a rare manifestation of ocular syphilis and is characterized by one or more placoid lesion at the posterior pole at fundoscopy, together with disruption of ellipsoid zone, presence of RPE elevation, and various degree of vitreous and corocapillar inflammation is usually characterized by a complete recovering of OCT structures after treatment with penicillin. We imaged three eyes of two patients with ASPPC and we followed them at 10 days after therapy and uh, at two months. We saw visual acuity improved together with finding at uh, spectral domain OCT and we saw regression of RPE bumps and outer retinal layer reconstitution with only minimal RPE damage seen at OCT and at fundus autofluorescence. We performed adaptive optics and we measured photoreceptor density and spacing and what at 1.5 degrees from the foveal center. We can see here adaptive optics imaging at presentation and over the follow-up compared to controls. At presentation, ASPPC patients display presence of dark patchy areas and tissue architecture disruption. Over the follow-up, we have a partial reconstitution with reduction in dark patchy areas and tissue architecture partial remodeling. 
Condensity was significantly lower compared to controls, both at presentation and at follow-up. Over the follow-up, we have a, a significant improvement in density of photoreceptors, although staying below the values seen in uh, control subjects. We can see here the affected eye of patient two over the follow-up with tissue remodeling and partial reconstitution. By comparing the affected eye of patient two and the unaffected eye of patient two, we see a difference in tissue architecture also at three months follow-up, although a complete recovery at OCT and in visual acuity. In conclusion, we can say that adaptive optics represents an additional tool in imaging as it is useful in assessing autoretinal diseases and monitor tissue reconstitution in the setting of multimodal imaging. Potentially, adaptive optics may be able to detect subclinical damage as a ima image details not seen in routine imaging. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, all the speakers. So we have some questions for uh, all of you. So try to be brief so that everybody can, can have a question. So uh, Dr. Mori, there's a, a very good question from Jason Higginbotham. His question is, was this actual cone loss or change in cone morphology? And I would add to this question, could this be improved uh, visualization following the resolution of the neuroretinopathy? So that's a question for Dr. Mori. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, do you mean the uh, subjective uh, recovery, subjective symptoms recovery will correlate the recovery of cell cells? Uh, <clears throat> Yes, uh, the patient said the uh, white spot became thinner and gradually she didn't feel about symptoms. So I think the subjective symptoms and the recovery of concerts are correlated very much. And uh, uh, the AO can detect the uh, uh, patient symptoms uh, but uh, the other conventional uh, equipment cannot detect. So it's very helpful for diagnosis. Thank you. Uh, a question for uh, Hassan. Uh, Hassan, uh, you talked about possi the possibility of, of, the ch of changes being secondary to dystrophy or inflammation. Uh, can you differentiate between which changes are secondary to dystrophy or inflammation, and do the changes recover? Do we have a do they do they do we get normal morphology or or pattern? Uh, actually, the, uh, this case was a challenging case because uh, there was a long-standing inflammation and it's still ongoing. So we need to follow up the cases with how oh, the, now the inflammation is, is not completely uh, cured. So if we have uh, a cured inflammation, then we can say that, okay, this is not because of the inflammation or because of the uh, dystrophy. So at this moment, I cannot say uh, your answer, uh, but I think most probably it's because of the dystrophy because uh, there's a cell loss. And again, after the cell loss, uh, there's a compensatory enlargement of the cells. But in this case, actually, I cannot definitely uh, say it is because of the dystrophy because it's still there's some ongoing inflammation. Daniela, I think you had a question for uh, Ursula. Yes, uh, Ursula, mm, congratulations for your excellent presentation. Uh, amazing images. Uh, um, just a question. Uh, um, did you assess the cone density after, uh, during follow-up after resolution of fluid? Uh, uh, do you think that uh, there is a, a lower density um, in the photoreceptor mosaic pattern suggesting uh, damage to cones uh, after clinical recovery? 
we only had uh, these three visits by the patient. And to be honest, I think the difficulty I personally found was that we, we created different mosaics from different scans. So we have different depths to start with. And the images that were the mosaics we saw or, or we have been seeing now, uh, they already look different, but on the same day. So the, the, okay. the, when the patient then came uh, two months later and four months later, we ha have now different sets. But the question is, well, should we actually have Take, taken, this, uh, taken the scans all in the same depths, which we did not do. So yeah. there is definitely a, this is definitely something to improve on. Um, but, but to me, the, the changes it, between the three visits, I mean, we can definitely see changes, but I don't know if the changes are actually significant. Um, is there something that we should make the patient aware of, or should we say, well, look, the changes are moving forward. Um, you need more treatment, or do we just go back to what we would normally say to the CSR patient? Well, let's just observe because this is going to come back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So this will go on with this patient. So the question is how much is a adaptive optics helpful or how should we interpret the results that we actually seen? Last question that is uh, again from Jason Higginbotham, a very good question. Uh, for uh, Stefano. Stefano, do you think there may be a link between uh, pachycorrhoid spectrum disease and photoreceptor density based on uh, these cases that you presented? This case that you presented? Uh, for the pachycorrhoid? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I per, uh, it may may alter the, 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 the cone mosaic for sure. Um, it, it, it all depends on the, um, uh, on the, on the degree in which, uh, in, in which stage we find that we find the disease, because we need to be sure that the, um, uh, that, 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 that the fluid is not altering the image quality for sure. But I think we need to look at the RPE for sure. So the, the damage state of the RPE is uh, maybe the, the, the most important thing to look at. Uh, by changing uh, RPE, so changes in RPE may alter the, uh, the, condensity, uh, the condensity value. And uh, uh, because RPE and photoreceptors uh, number are, uh, are, are linked. I'm very much linked. Thank you very much to all the speakers of this session.